Hello, you're watching a Euractive Thought Leadership interview, and today we're going to be talking about Europe's competitiveness in the world, and specifically a new documentary called Made in Europe, From Mine to Electric Vehicle, which will be premiering during the EU's Raw Materials Week. We're talking with the documentary's host, Tom Jones, who's the director of the Catholic University of Leuven's Institute for Sustainable Metals and Minerals. So, Tom, tell me, why did you make this documentary? I wanted to have a wake-up call for Europe, for European citizens, for opinion makers, for policy makers, because Europe is really sleepwalking into an abyss. That's very clear. The message comes out very clear in our documentary. We really have to realize that we've entered a new stage in the world order. The, the neoliberal order is over. We've entered a new era of resource nationalism, protectionism, and Europe is sleepwalk, sleepwalking into an abyss. We really need to get our act together because the way we're going on now, we're going to see that the decarbonization that we're trying to get organized is directly leading to a deindustrialization in Europe. And we really need to make sure that we can reverse that and that we can allow the decarbonization to go hand in hand with a clean tech based reindustrialization. In our documentary, we focus on electric vehicles. But basically, we could have told the same story for wind turbines, photovoltaic panels, electrolyzers, because it's for every single clean technology that we face the same problems. So, so much of this policy is made at EU level here in Brussels. Who did you interview for this documentary and why did you choose them as interview subjects? Well, we, we really focused on the Nordic countries. Uh, why did we do that? Because we see that in the Nordic countries, they have the, the resources, the raw materials, they have the, the technologies and they have the desire to develop the full supply chain from mine to refinery, battery factory and to EV production. So we really see the Nordic countries as the, the benchmark for the rest of the world, but also for the rest of Europe. So it's like the success story of Europe. So that's why we, we went to visit two mines close to the North Pole. One is uh, the iconic Kiruna iron ore mine which also has a satellite deposit, which is the biggest rare earth deposit in, in Europe. And we visited the famous uh, copper mine, the biggest open pit mine in Europe, um, of Boliden in Aitik, also very high up in the north. And then later we went to see uh, several plants in, in Finland to show the, the full supply chain, so from the mines in, in Sweden, but then the refinery in Harjavalta, Finland, the battery factory and the EV assembly in um, different parts in the south of Finland. But we also made sure that we, we wanted to show the other side of the narrative as well. So I had a very special day with Stefan Mikkelson. Stefan Mikkelson is the, the leader of, this, of one of the leaders of the Sami parliament in the, in the north of Sweden, the indigenous people, because not many people realize that in, in Europe we also have indigenous people. And these people, yes, they have a completely different way of life. Uh, it's based on reindeer, husbandry. And this way of life is endangered by the Western way of life, including the mining industry, but also the, the wind turbines and everything else that is linked to, to clean technologies. So it's a different narrative, but we want to show this out of respect. And of course, we also um, made sure we got uh, the, voice f the voice of Europe. So we had a very, very interesting interview with Maros Sefkovic. Uh, in fact, that full interview, 35 minutes, will also appear as a separate video, but we will show the different parts, the best parts of his uh, answers will be featured in our main documentary as well. So Maros Shevchevich is the vice president of the European Commission, who's now in charge of the Green Deal, which is this big umbrella framework uh, put forward by Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. Um, what were the key takeaways from what you talked to him about? Because a lot of people are really watching him right now to see what his vision for the Green Deal and for the EU's energy transition is going to be. I think he's absolutely a vital person in this transition and in this Green Deal because if, if someone can move the needle in Europe, it's this person. And that, that's very clear. So I was surprised to see how much he was in the same wavelength as myself. He really stresses the need to cover the entire supply chain from mine to electric vehicle, but also the upstream part. So where do we get the raw materials from? Because that's often forgotten. Uh, in Europe, we've had a tendency to export our responsibility and to import our raw materials because it's easy to have the mines elsewhere in the world. So the problems are elsewhere in the world. 
But Sefcovic realizes that we really need to get our act together. So in terms of mining, he, he, he speaks about Pimbi, please, in my backyard, as an alternative to not in my backyard. And I asked him about, yeah, what about the, the investors' mood? Because we see that the political mood is changed in Europe. People start to realize in the European Commission that we will need to domestically extract critical raw materials, but the investors aren't there yet. And Sefcovic had a very interesting answer there, saying that when he started working on the European Battery Alliance, he saw the same thing about the investments in the gigafactories. So he, he believes that there will be uh, investments coming also in the, the mining sector itself. Secondly, we, we spoke about the concept of fair metals, uh, like fair trade chocolate, fair trade coffee, uh, because what we produce in Europe, made in Europe metals, it's more expensive than made in China metals because we take ESG criteria seriously. So it's obviously going to be more expensive. So Sefcovic was very clear there. He said, look, if the CO2 footprint of the imported final metals that we, we get here is very high and we have very low CO2 footprint, then he made it very clear that either pay the carbon tax at home or pay it at the border. So basically he was saying we need to expand the carbon border adjustment mechanism, not only for, for steel or cement, but also to nickel and lithium and any other energy transition metal. Thirdly, uh, about the EV assembly, that was a very funny part in the interview. Um, so for me, it's clear that the Chinese EV industry has already leapfrogged the European EV industry. The, the European car industry waited way too long to go electric. And now the European, EV, the European EV industry is really having trouble to catch up with the Chinese EV industry. So I said to him, game set in match, China? And his answer was, no, because the European tennis players are better than the Chinese tennis players. But yeah, joking aside, um, it's clear that uh, Europe does realize there is a problem there. Von der Leyen has started her anti-subsidy investigation into the unfair subsidies in the Chinese EVs because they will be 40% cheaper than the ones we produce here. And of course, it's all based on state subsidies. So Sefcovic was very clear, if found guilty, then we will use all potential trade defense mechanisms to keep these EVs out of Europe. As you mentioned, this topic of unfair competition uh, from China, or from other countries that might not have as stringent climate legislation, is a big topic right now in Brussels. And we've you mentioned the carbon border adjustment mechanism. So that's a charge that will apply to the import of goods that have a uh, that don't essentially don't have as, as stringent from countries that don't have as stringent climate legislation. Uh, just took effect uh, October first. Do you think that that is the right approach, uh, this charging, uh, import charging approach? Can that help shield uh, European companies from unfair competition when they have to comply with climate legislation that Chinese companies do not? Well, I think it's definitely part of the equation. I'm not saying it's the only answer, uh, but for me, it's, it's clear that we see a situation where China directs, United States incentivizes, and Europe regulates. And the problem is that the, the speed at which we can get things done is much slower than the American or the Chinese system. So I, th I do think we need to learn something from what, what they are doing. So incentivization in terms of uh, subsidies uh, towards EV um, consumers, I think that's also part of the equation because we, it's all about the speed of operation. Now we really need to get our act together quickly we can't wait another five years to do something if we if we wait another five years we've lost the battle it's clear then it's game set and match china for sure so we, we really need to include all these potential mechanisms but we have to get some kind of consensus across the left and the, the right in the, in the political spectrum in europe because we're in this together if we don't solve this problem uh, we will have a massive deindustrialization and impoverishment of europe and i don't think Anyone, wherever you are in the political spectrum, we, we have everything to lose in that way. So we really need to, to learn from what the Chinese and the Americans have done and sort of integrate that and move faster. Um, as we're looking ahead toward the future, where do we go from here? What's your sense after having um, uh, made the documentary? Where's your sense of where we're going as a continent here in Europe? 
Well, I think we, we really have a fork in the road at the moment. We really have to choose what we're going to do. Either we continue working in this cumbersome way, bureaucratic way, with lots of red tape, and we, we don't get our permits sorted, we don't get our financial system sorted, we don't have the investment coming in, and then we are lost. And I think that's exactly why we have this documentary. It's a wake-up call also to European citizens, because European citizens think that because Europe has been rich for a long time, that we will stay rich for a long time. So they extrapolate the successful past into, into the future, but that's not a given anymore. If we don't change the way we work, we have a very negative scenario popping up. And I think uh, slowly we are seeing that Europe is, is waking up. Uh, it's taken a long time to wake up, but I do see a lot of positive signals that things are changing now for the better. Yeah, as the saying goes, in order for things to stay the same, everything has to change. Um, so what, last question for you, what are your next uh, projects? What are you going to be working on now that the documentary is completed? Well, I have one side project of this. Uh, I want to make a special documentary about the Sami perspective because that was for me the most painful day, but also at the same time most beautiful day to, to spend the whole day with this leader of the Sami parliament and see a completely different way of life. So out of respect for that person, Stefan Mikkelson, I really want to show their way of life, their perspective, even though it's not my perspective, because it's, it's contrary to what I'm trying to, to protect here. But still, I, I want to show the Sami perspective uh, and really give everybody an un a better understanding in Europe of our indigenous people in this continent, because people don't know this. And the second thing I'll be working on is a specific documentary on lithium. Because we all know lithium is the poster boy of the clean transition. The batteries can't do without lithium. Um, and the big contrast between, for example, lithium and rare earth metals is that for rare earths, we just need to open one big rare earth mine in Europe and our whole dependency problem is solved. If you would open the Pergeier deposit in, in Kiruna in the north of Sweden and we refine the concentrates in La Rochelle in France, then our rare earth problem is solved, period. For lithium, that is not the case. For lithium, the quantities that we need are so huge that we will need loads of mines and also refineries. At this moment, there is no operational lithium mine in Europe. There is no operational lithium refinery in Europe. So no mining, no refining, whereas lithium is the most important strategic critical element of the clean tech transition. So I'll be making a new documentary on lithium mining and refining in Europe. The thing is that, um, as I said, the deposits are spread out all over Europe. So it's not just the Nordic countries. We also have potential mines in Spain, Portugal, France. But there you see immediately that the public acceptance of mining in Portugal is way more difficult than it is in the north of Sweden. So part of the documentary will, will be about well, why are people so negatively opposed to, to mining in Europe? Yeah. And I would try to change their minds, of course. <laughs> well, the documentary will be premiering during Raw Materials Week. We look forward to seeing it. Tom Jones, thanks so much for speaking with us here at Your Active. Thank you very much for having me.